Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkes, your host, and our guest is David Cameron, a professor of political science and the director of the Yale Program in European Union Studies. Currently, Europe is facing an unprecedented humanitarian crisis. Day after day, thousands of refugees from Syria, Iraq, and other countries have undertaken long and perilous journeys, both across the Mediterranean and through the Balkans, in the hope of finding shelter and obtaining asylum in the European Union. Every day we hear of one EU state after another instituting border controls, some quite drastic, to stop the flow of migrants. And day after day, we hear about disagreements among the members of the EU over how to respond to the crisis, including how to share in the burden of receiving the migrants. As we speak, the heads of state and government of the 28 EU member states are gathering in Brussels for an emergency meeting to discuss what to do about the ongoing situation. Professor Cameron joins us today to help us unravel this crisis. Welcome, Professor Cameron. Thank you, Marilyn. It's good to be here. Yes, and um, you've been here a number of times, and we appreciate mm -hmm. that, to talk about the EU crisis, um, and specifically Greece. Mm -hmm. So let's start with Greece. They just, you know, they have migration issues as well with migrants coming from Turkey, um, and they've also just had an election. So bring us up to speed there. Okay. Uh, Greece uh, called an election in August after they obtained approval uh, of the EU bailout which was negotiated in July. Very difficult negotiation. You may recall there was a referendum that Al Alexis Tsipras called on July 5th. A large majority, over 60 percent, uh, said they didn't want the EU conditions. The next day he called a meeting of five party leaders and they agreed that they would agree to uh, a bailout and those parties would support the government in negotiating the bailout and approving the plan, but only at that point, mm -hmm. only up to that point. So they got the approval of the bailout in August. Uh, in the course of doing that, uh, about 30 of the Syriza, the governing party, the hard left governing party, about 30 of the MPs, members of parliament, uh, voted against the government mm -hmm. and uh, decided to leave Syriza and form their own left of the left party. Mm -hmm. And at that point, uh, Cyprus knew that he had lost his governing majority, which was very thin. So he called a new election. Uh, the, election uh, the election took place on September 20th. Uh, all of the polls said it would be very close uh, between Syriza and New Democracy and, mm -hmm. and estimated they were basically even. And it wasn't clear Syriza would be able to form a government. As it turned out, the polls were wrong. Syriza got almost the same percentage of the vote that it got in January. Uh, Which is what? About 36 percent. Mm -hmm. But because of a quirk in the electoral system, the largest party uh, gets an additional 50 seats. Wow. Uh, it's, it, is, <laughs> it is a quirk. It's uh -huh. a proportional representation Quite for a all nice quirk. parties, over 3 percent, but the leading party gets an additional 50. Mm -hmm. so they still didn't have enough to form a majority, but they were able to form a majority with a small right-wing party uh, that is against austerity. So ideologically, it's not even close to Syriza, but both parties are against austerity. So we now have a new government. Alexis Tsipras is back. Mm -hmm. um, he's feeling victorious and actually not very much has changed from where we were in January, although we've had an enormous amount of, of drama mm -hmm. and uh, uncertainty about right. this. Now the hard work starts. They have to actually implement all of the reforms and conditions that the EU required uh, in return for getting the 86 billion. And whether that happens is anyone's guess at this point. Uh, yes, because one of the <coughs> reasons Cyprus was voted in was because he said we would not stand for those um, measures of austerity right. and now it seems like they're back right at square one again with those same they austerity are. measures yeah. in place. So it seems yeah. somewhat crazy. They are. they are. Well, it's a Greek story <laughs> and it just goes on. And uh, 
they now, uh, uh, they now have to implement uh, austerity. They will soften it a bit, and the EU will let them soften it a bit mm -hmm. from what it was before. But they have to privatize big sections of the economy, certain firms that are state-owned. Mm -hmm. They have to cut spending. They have to raise taxes. There's a lot of uh, raising of taxes in the uh, program that the EU has prepared mm -hmm. for Greece. It's hard, though, to raise those taxes when so many people are out of work. Well, that's I mean, right. it, seems, it seems an impossible situation to fix. And it's hard to cut spending, too. Uh, Greece is essentially in a depression, has been in a depression for five years. Mm -hmm. Very high rates of unemployment, uh, especially youth unemployment, but uh, throughout the entire economy. Uh, and cutting spending and raising taxes in the midst of a depression is not the way you get out. Right. Uh, the way you get out is you spend more and you tax less and you put money in the pockets of the mm -hmm. people and create demand in the economy. Right, right. So why is that not being done? Well, the EU thinks this is the way to go and they have a, um, a they have a, uh, some might even say a fetish with uh, balanced budgets or near balanced budgets mm -hmm. and 3% deficit ratio to GDP as a maximum a target. Uh, so if that's your target and the country's been spending well over that, then you keep telling them to institute mm -hmm. more austerity. And the problem is the economy has been going down and contracting. Right. So in your uh, deficit to GDP ratio, the denominator is shrinking, the, the economy is shrinking, so the deficit is large, so they have mm -hmm. to keep cutting. Right. And it really uh, is a never-ending um, process. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it's, it's a problem that I think is um, one that has caused a great deal of pain in, yes. in, in Greece. Yes. And, um, it uh, seems like it's just going to lead to disaster, frankly. Eventually, uh, they, I think, will get out of it. But the problem now that the government faces is that they um, have an enormous amount of debt, uh, over 200 percent of GDP by next year. Uh, and the debt isn't sustainable. They can't pay all of that debt back, and all of that debt is owed to the official creditors, the EU, the European Central Bank, the International Monetary Fund, uh, and Greece would like debt relief, um, but that means um, giving a haircut, as they call it, mm -hmm. to the official creditors, and the official creditors don't want that. Of course not. So uh, there's going to be, um, we're not out of the woods yet mm -hmm. in, terms of, uh, in terms of the uh, Eurozone crisis, mm -hmm. uh, at least for Greece. Uh, and how long do you think it'll be before, <coughs> you know, we see uh, a sign of w whether it's working or it's clearly not going to work? Well, I think, uh, I think we'll see a very gradual process of um, very slow, uh, recovery over in the next several years. Mm -hmm. It'll be a long process. A lot of people who've lost their jobs probably won't get their jobs back. Uh, it's going to be a very difficult time. Mm -hmm. It'll be a difficult time for Syriza f and for Cyprus to govern mm -hmm. in part because a lot of the people, while, while there was a defection of a group called the Left Platform, mm -hmm. there's still a lot of people in Syriza who are opposed to austerity, opposed to the Eurozone dictatorship, as they call it, uh, want uh, Greece to drop out of the Eurozone and, and adopt a new currency of its own, mm -hmm. don't want to pay the debt back, want debt relief. Uh, so there is a lot of uh, internal dissension within the government. Yeah. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, distrust and disaffection in the population as a whole. Mm -hmm. The election had the lowest turnout, turnout rate in the history of the country. Right. They're probably saying, why bother? <coughs> Nothing's going to change. I mean, and let me ask this, uh, since we're going to start talking about the migrant issue. Because of the, such the, uh, the severity of the austerity measures, do you foresee um, the people of Greece actually becoming migrants as well if they can't find work going to different countries? Um, that's an interesting question. I think uh, for some who can get work elsewhere, they will do that. Young people mm -hmm. with um, skills and 
they obviously can move. Uh, they're part of the EU. They're part of the right. Schengen Accord in the EU, which is free movement across borders. Um, a single um, internal market applies to the movement of people as well as goods and services, mm -hmm. according to the EU. And they've instituted, uh, through the Schengen Accord of 1985-90, They've uh, instituted free movement. So young people um, with skills could certainly go, but a lot of people who are older, a lot of people who perhaps don't have the skills needed in mm -hmm. the job markets elsewhere in Europe. And of course, one of the problems is all of the countries in Europe are um, experiencing relatively low growth. They're not, they're not doing well. They're not mm -hmm. doing as well as, uh, well, with a few exceptions, uh, the UK has been doing pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, and a lot of the countries. And everyone seems to want to go to Germany. A lot, yeah, and and there are of course many, many people who mm -hmm. want to go to Germany yes. right now. Um, so I think uh, it's it's a time when many people in Greece are quite uh, are disappointed, disaffected. Uh, think they've gone through nine months of drama mm -hmm. with it's no going consequence. On for a while. And uh, they have the same old government back, which is going to be doing something, has to do a uh, policy that it doesn't really believe in. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, it's not a good situation for right. Greece. Okay, so uh, let's look at the migration <laughs> crisis. Why are so many trying to get to Europe? Well, the, the, the problem is, uh, I guess the way to think about this is uh, start with the Syrian war, the civil war that began uh, four years ago, more than four years ago. Uh, and um, we have something on the order of 10 million people in Syria who've been displaced, mm -hmm. lost their homes. There are about 4 million refugees uh, from Syria, 2 million of them uh, in Turkey, a uh, million in Jordan, a million in uh, Lebanon. Um, the refugee uh, problem uh, has just become impossible for those countries. The international um, donors haven't given enough, uh, given their, the contributions they promised to the UN uh, High Commission on Refugees. Uh, and uh, so the, um, where the refugees have gone uh, is a place that's not very comfortable for them at all. Uh, and becoming much more difficult for them. Mm -hmm. um, now, they might be willing to stay there if they thought the war was going to be resolved anytime soon and they mm -hmm. could go home. But it's clear the war is getting worse, and ISIS is doing very well in Syria over the past year and is making uh, uh, rather dramatic gains within Syria. Uh, in fact, they've even, they're approaching Damascus, which I think is one reason the Russians are going in to try to create a little enclave for mm -hmm. their friend uh, Assad. A and when he has to quickly run from Damascus, which will happen in the next few months, I think. Um, so from the point of view of the refugees, where they are now is really not a very good situation at all because they're not getting the, the the care, the attention, the food, the medicine, uh, medical uh, supplies that mm -hmm. they need in the refugee camps in Turkey, Jordan, and Lebanon because the international aid has been uh, uh, insufficient. And, and why they is look that? at, well, and then they, well, the donors just haven't come through with as much as uh, they wildly underestimated how much they would need. Mm -hmm. uh, no one anticipated there would be four million refugees. Um, in the nearby countries. Mm -hmm. uh, so the aid has been insufficient and the countries thus far haven't um, contributed uh, the additional amount. Then the refugees look at Syria and they look at the war and they look at what's happening in the war and they realize they're never going to go back. They're never going to be able to go back. Um, the odds that we will have a peaceful settlement in Syria so that all of those four million can go home uh, is unrealistic now, and many of them have lost their homes. The war has been immensely damaging to the housing stock in the cities and the mm -hmm. towns in Syria. So they look at this situation and a rational refugee then says, well, I'm going to uh, go to Europe mm -hmm. where I can get asylum. Right. Uh, and so that's been a big, uh, I think it's a sort of a push 
uh, from given the developments in the Syrian war and, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, the situation of refugees in those mm -hmm. nearby uh, countries. So does the EU have a policy <laughs> for asylum seekers? Well, it does. It has a policy. Uh, the problem is uh, the policy hasn't been uh, implemented and, and is really not capable of dealing with the numbers that we're seeing mm -hmm. now. Uh, I mean, the OECD is estimating that there will be a million refugees coming to uh, Europe this year, and about 500,000 of them will be legitimate asylum seekers and, and will get uh, asylum within the EU. The EU is committed to providing asylum, um, meaning international protection, uh, and they've made it clear that that applies to everyone who's Syrian, mm -hmm. but it applies also to those uh, fleeing Iraq those fleeing Eritrea, those three countries are, are the EU has said um, are eligible, anyone from those countries is eligible for asylum. Now the way it works is the state which receives the um, asylum mm -hmm. seekers, the first state, the frontline state, is supposed to register the people, fingerprint them, uh, take their application, process the application, and uh, while they're there, give them a temporary residence, and if their application is accepted, uh, give them residence uh, permits for uh, several years. The problem is uh, Greece hasn't done that at all, mm -hmm. and I know this is uh, uh, somewhat facetious to say, but basically the policy of the Cyprus government in dealing with the refugees, uh, Syrian refugees coming from Turkey, has been to put up a road sign pointing to Macedonia and, and just um, telling them to go north to Macedonia and then they go through no Macedonia north to Serbia and then they get to Hungary and of course we've seen what's happened right, in Hungary right. uh, which has felt overwhelmed um, and put up uh, barbed wire fences and so forth. Mm -hmm. So they've taken a left uh, at Hungary and gone to Croatia. Mm -hmm and Croatia has received something like 70,000 refugees in, in, a, in the past week, and it's overwhelmed as well. All of the countries now are putting up border controls, and uh, um, if, they're, if they're good Europeans, they're putting up border controls, reasserting border controls, which Schengen, the free movement uh, provisions, allow in emergencies. Uh, there are some countries, such as Hungary, um, an outlier which is building fences and is now building a fence having built the fence between itself and Serbia is building one between itself and Romania and one between itself and uh, and Croatia so it, the Balkans are having a great deal of difficulty dealing with this mm -hmm. and it's been in that context that the uh, uh, interior ministers justice and home affairs ministers met yesterday and the um, uh, leaders of the EU are meeting today. And what do you think the outcome will be? Well, yesterday we had a really, a very interesting and unusual meeting. Um, uh, prior, to the, prior to that meeting, uh, the EU had agreed, uh, starting last spring and through the summer, to develop a plan to uh, distribute the refugees on a quota basis to all of the member states. Mm -hmm. And they plan to distribute 40,000 from Italy and Greece uh, to um, the member states. Uh, and this was prompted by the flow that came across the Mediterranean last spring when the boatloads were coming across and people were, uh, many boats were sinking. There right. were terrible boats. They, a lot of them were over, yeah. overloaded. They were people were drowning, so uh, several thousand people died in the course of that. And at that point, Greece and Italy, which were the prime recipients of the refugees, um, um, had this plan developed, or the EU developed it, uh, to relieve them by taking the refugees and distributing them throughout the EU. It was basically similar to a plan the Germans developed in 1949, used again in 1989 when they got a flow of people coming from uh, the East, used it again uh, 
uh, in the Balkans uh, wars of the early 90s in which Germany uh, developed a formula to distribute uh, asylum seekers throughout the country, mm -hmm. um, taking into account, uh, for example, distributing among the states according to the wealth of the, or the, um, uh, the tax revenues of the, um, of the state and uh, the size of the states mm -hmm. within Germany. And they've basically adapted that to the EU so that we, they now have a quota for those 40,000. Well, for the last several weeks, there's, there have been debates going on at the ministerial level about that. Some of the states don't want any quotas. Some of the states don't want it to be mandatory, want it to be voluntary. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, as the crisis got worse, uh, with the flow from Turkey to Greece to the Balkans um, over the summer and, and early fall, the European Commission, its civil service, uh, came up with a plan for uh, 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 distributing another 120,000 people mm -hmm. in addition uh, to the 40, so making this a total of 160,000. Uh, and this has created even more mm -hmm. difficulty for some of the states. Now, yesterday, I know I'm going on about this. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, uh, just a quick question. Are they putting these um, migrants into camps, giant camps? Or, you know, how are they integrating them into the country in some way? Well, no, and that's a, that's a, real, that's a real issue. I mean, what we've seen, in, especially in Hungary, where they weren't giving them, they had no camps really. Mm -hmm. um, they put some, after several days or weeks, uh, they put a number of people coming into so-called transit camps that were really just uh, fenced in yards. Mm -hmm. But you remember all the scenes of people being uh, jammed into right. trains and, and they were just passing them on to the next country. Um, Croatia has, uh, over the last week, has been um, uh, much more uh, uh, um, supportive in a way. They've developed uh, transit camps. They've taken people by bus from the Hungarian border, the Serbian border, to, to, to the transit camps, giving them uh, showers and clothes and blankets and food, medical attention and then have bussed them on, um, continuing on, on their path. But it's a real problem. Um, and the, so one of the problems in this crisis is the Turkey, Jordan, Lebanon can't, uh, can't man and staff and care for the refugees in the way they should be. Mm -hmm. and, and even the international agencies aren't doing enough. A second problem is the frontline states that are receiving them aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing under Schengen, uh, and they aren't providing any care. So in Greece, uh, there's been really nothing done for the refugees arriving. And they don't want to stay there, they want to go on. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, what they have beckoning them at the end of the road is uh, Germany. And Angela Merkel, to her credit, has said, uh, we will accept um, all Syrians. Um, mm -hmm. And um, she they said that before there. she knew exactly how many <laughs> would be, would take her up on that offer. Um, so Germany is now instituting um, controls, uh, the the controls that that any state is supposed to uh, institute to check and make sure this person is really a legitimate asylum seeker, mm -hmm. as opposed to simply someone who is seeking uh, an economic. Uh, opportunity and, uh, and sort of in the midst of the uh, asylum mm -hmm. uh, seekers. Um, so uh, the, I guess the second major problem, in addition to dealing with the, the refugees in the near country, countries near to Syria, the second problem is how do you deal with the uh, frontline states that are re just because of geography mm -hmm. are the ones that, bearing the brunt. that bear the brunt. So clearly one of the things the leaders will be doing today will be to provide assistance for countries such as Italy and Greece which are receiving uh, the refugees mm -hmm. to give them additional funding and staffing the, because Greece in particular with everything else it's been dealing with mm 
has just n thrown up its arms and and said it's been unable mm -hmm. to right. cope with the numbers. So let me ask you this. We, you have a number, thousands of people entering into the country. Where are they going? Where are they sleeping? How do they eat? Uh, well, they're, they're, it's, a, it's a terrible, uh, terribly difficult situation for all of them because they don't know where they're okay. going. Mm -hmm. They don't know where they'll be allowed to go. They don't know where they'll be staying. Uh, many of them have had to pay smugglers and human traffickers mm -hmm. to make uh, this long trip, a series of uh, sure. uh, uh, trips uh, um, with smugglers and people making money on, on, on this at every turn. So it's a very difficult uh, situation for them. And the real problem in the EU, in addition to dealing with the refugee camp crisis, in addition to dealing with the frontline crisis uh, and after the relocation crisis is what happens, what do the states do for these right. uh, refugees? They need language training, mm -hmm. obviously. They're, they're Arabic speakers. They, right. they will need to know some German or Swedish or wherever they end up. They'll need language training. They'll need housing. They'll need jobs. They'll need all of the um, effort of the states to integrate them in some way into their societies, right. their economy as right, well. Right. And, and so that's a third area that the EU uh, will be talking about today in the, in the meeting of the leaders mm -hmm. because relocating the refugees is fine. You disperse them um, through all the states, sharing the burden. Um, uh, now, it is the case that not all of the states have agreed, and yesterday's meeting of ministers was very interesting because we had a vote w where they adopted this plan for another 120,000, uh, despite the opposition of four states of uh, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Romania, and Hungary. And uh, I can't think of any... Um, any decision that's been taken at the ministerial level in the EU that didn't involve just rather mundane legislation and administrative matters that has actually been done by a majority vote rather than by consensus, okay. which is the way they normally operate, um, uh, especially when it involves an executive decision that really involves national sovereignty. Mm -hmm. um, it's unusual to have a an up or down vote where you're either in the majority or you're not. Uh -huh. And uh, so a couple of the countries that said no, no to the quotas and no to this um, quota system, have threatened to take uh, the uh, European Union to the European Court of Justice and mm -hmm. challenge it. Wow. Um, so it's, it's quite a historic, yes. uh, I'd almost say it was a historic vote yesterday mm -hmm. in that uh, France and Germany in particular just um, insisted that there be a vote, an up and down vote on this quota system and that the countries agree. Uh, and getting Poland to agree was an absolutely essential priority because the way they vote, they have a complicated uh, weighted voting system that takes into account the population of the state. Mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, it's called qualified majority voting. and. Once Poland was on board with Germany and France, they had the 70% uh, or so mm -hmm. that they needed for that uh, majority. Uh, to make it that every all of the 28 members so of the EU So now it applies passed. to everyone. So even um, Serbia and the, the ones that did not well, want. Well, Serbia, Serbia and, and Macedonia aren't yet members. They're okay. on the track so to membership. The um, ones who dissented and but the do others. not want to, so now they're going to be forced to they take all, some of the migrants. They all are obliged to, to participate in this plan mm -hmm. uh, because uh, they voted it and, and they right. proved it, so it's now a decision taken by the council. Now that will be a big issue that will come up today because these states will come in and say uh, that we're not going to do this. Uh -huh. In fact, the um, prime minister of Slovakia has already said uh, we will not be taking anyone, uh, any refugee, under this quota system as long as I'm prime minister. And, you know, why is that? I mean, 
Well, it's... Um, is it an ethnicity thing? It, I mean? it, it, it's, it's a cultural, it's a cultural ethnicity, it's a religious thing. Um, uh, they've said um, um, at one point, I think uh, one of the ministers said they would only take uh, Christians. Uh, uh, they didn't want to take anyone who's mm -hmm. Muslim, and of course we're talking about right, an right, overwhelmingly right. Muslim yeah. uh, country and, and group of refugees. Um, so it's, it's ethnicity, it's mm -hmm. religion, it's cultural um, um, difference and distinction. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, you know, it's, we've, we've seen it in this country. Um, Everywhere in the world we've and, seen it. And uh, it's, uh, it's something the Europeans aren't proud of, um, who see this among the European mm -hmm. states, especially for people who are suffering so much. Exactly. And, and going through so much. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, um, and and it it shows that um, beneath the facade of European solidarity, when you get to really tough issues, uh, there often is not a consensus, mm -hmm. and and there are different views of what yeah. is in the national interest, which makes things very difficult. Well, I could talk to you all day about this. Um, hopefully, um, you know, the leaders and the and the, the ministers will come up with some kind of plan that will help these thousands yeah, of migrants. I, I think now for the first time, unfortunately it's taken so long, but for the first time the European Union with the leaders uh, uh, meeting today will deal with the problem of the refugee camps bordering Syria, the frontline states. They also need to deal with the Balkan states with, through which the refugees have been moving mm -hmm. uh, and they need some assistance. They need to uh, put this quota system in place. And then they have to deal with the last point that we were talking about, about integrating the refugees into the countries mm -hmm. once, once they are located wherever they right. end up being located. Which will probably so it's be a difficult. huge challenge. Yeah. Uh, huge challenge. Angela Merkel has said um, this crisis uh, um, makes the uh, Eurozone crisis as important as it was pale in comparison. Right. Uh, mm. Well, thank you so much for being here with us well, today. Well, you're welcome. Okay. Thank you. For more information about Professor Cameron and his research, please visit our website at macmillanreport.yale.edu. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale.